Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great this morning. Feels like awesome. a good day. Yes, it does. I'm just going to give a few a few seconds, maybe like a minute or two for everyone to log on. Sounds good. Great. I see Renine. Hi, Renine. I know she just joined. Another intern. I'm really excited to be here today. I am too. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Alrighty. At the 11.01 mark, I think we can go ahead and start and see. Okay. Sounds good. Finding the right camera angle, always hard on these things. So I have my headphones and my plug is underneath the phone. So I'm like plopping it with like a bunch yeah. of stuff so it doesn't fall. Yeah, mine is literally like propped with like a candle and then like a tripod. I'm like trying to like make sure it's like perfect. Yeah. Alrighty, so I think we've got a good amount of people and then whoever else is joining, we have to do a little intro anyways, so they should be able to not miss any of what we're talking about. So good morning, everybody. I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Marissa Munoz, and I've been an intern with ConnectOC since last fall, and it's been a great time. Um, I'm excited to be here today um, to host this Instagram Live with our co-host. And I just wanted to first, for anyone who doesn't already know, ConnectOC is a coalition dedicated to increasing accessibility to mental health services for Orange County transitional age youth, young adults, and their families by networking them to local community mental health resources. If you want to find out more, um, you can definitely visit our Instagram. And also, um, including resources, events, and how to get involved, you can go to connect-oc.org. Um, so here with me today, we do have our wonderful co-host, Monica. Um, your last name, Mikhail? I'm not sure. Mikhail, yes. Okay, great. Um, a licensed marriage and family therapist. Monica, why don't you, you know, give us a little more info and introduce yourself? Yes, of course. I have been a um, marriage and family therapist. I've been working with Didi Hirsch, um, a mental health community, mental health agency. Um, I've been working there for about six years. I've been in community mental health for almost like nine years. <laughs> I've been licensed for four years. Now I'm a lead clinical supervisor at the Child and Family Division in Inglewood. Um, I do specialize in trauma informed care. Uh, I have a lot of evidence based practices underneath my belt um, uh, seeking safety, map, um, trauma focused CBT. Mm -hmm. I have uh, dabbled a bit with the zero to five child and parent psychotherapy, um, some triple P parenting certification. Um, I predominantly really focus on play therapy because play therapy really language, uh, the child's language is through play. Um, so that's one of my biggest uh, focuses is now. And then also group therapy. I love running groups. Um, so that is, that is it for me. That's currently where I'm at. Wow. That, that's a lot. It's so amazing. I know you must Thank have you. so much experience. Um, so great. We're so excited to have you here today. And, um, I also want to mention that we would like um, everyone who's watching right now, viewers, to participate in a short survey after watching this live. You get the chance to win um, an Amazon gift card. So you can find the survey at the link in our bio. Um, you can just click on um, our connect underscore OC and then link in bio. It should be there and it should be really easy to find. It'll be listed if you just scroll down. Um, and lastly, before we get started, we do want to give a trigger warning, you know, just since the following conversation is going to uh, cover sensitive topics that might bring up some stuff. Uh, I myself have also struggled with self harm in the past. So you know, I know how important it is just to let that be said before we uh, dive into the conversation. So let's let's start, right? Let's start. <laughs> All right. So the first thing we want to talk about is what is self-harm you know there might be some people that don't know what self-harm is it might be something that um, some of us don't fully comprehend so um, I would say in simple terms self-harm self-injury you know means hurting yourself on purpose right mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. would you want to elaborate on that um, Monica 
Yeah. Uh, self-harm can manifest differently for everyone. Um, and the ways people may self-harm extend far beyond the usual reference um, to cutting in social media or just media in general. Um, simply self-harm is anything someone can do to purposely hurt their body. Um, and that could be a variety of things like hair pulling, um, um, you know, scratching, um, um, using a razor blade. So all there's different forms of, of self-harm. Right. Yeah. Um, for sure. It, it can even be in extreme cases, bone breaking, you know, um, it can really lead to a lot of hospital visits and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but you're right, mostly in social media and in the media on TV, mostly the only thing that we see for the most part is cutting and and burning. But yeah, there is it can manifest in a lot of different ways. So thank you for elaborating on that. So now, of course, the next question and the next topic we want to cover is why do people self harm? You know, there's a lot of people that struggle with mental health issues and they never self harm. So what, you know, what is it that leads someone to take that path instead mm -hmm. of someone who doesn't? For, you know, for some people when depression and anxiety lead to, to a tornado of emotions, um, they turn to self harm to look, look, looking for a release. And usually when people self harm, they do not do so as a suicide attempt, rather they self harm as a way to release painful emotions. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of different whys, you know, uh, they have intense numbness and are trying to feel something or break out of something. Um, you know, self harm is a maladaptive coping mechanism for managing difficult life situations to feel that escape to avoid certain emotions um, or have a sense of control even. Um, and then sometimes, you know, reasons why they may self-harm self is to express built up emotions. People don't like, people don't have a safe space to talk about their feelings. And so sometimes it's the only outlet for them to externalize the inner turmoil. Um, and then we have some who have really like low self-esteem and feeling of worthlessness may um, have them end up engaging in self-harm behavior. Um, it could also be this impulse uh, when they feel like they're in this dark place. Um, some use it to punish themselves. Um, some do it to remind them of why they're alive. Um, some distract, it's, it could be a form of distraction to maybe a suicidal thought. Um, and unfortunately, self-harm can end up being a really unhealthy habit that can lead to accidental suicide. Right. Um, again, there's just so many reasons, but it's really important to be mindful of, you know, understanding what meaning this, does this behavior serve? You know, what, what is their need and what can we support them? Um, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I definitely think I completely agree. You know, it, the why I think is so much to cover. There is so many reasons why someone might feel that way and, mm -hmm. um, and feel the need to do that. Um, you know, when I was self-harming, I started self-harming when I was 11 up until I was s about 17. And I think it was a mix of so many of those things. I couldn't pinpoint. It was half the time. I didn't even know why I was doing it. I think it was just, I'm so overwhelmed. I feel so who can I talk to, you know, and it, it felt like, okay, I have control over this one thing. So let me do that. You know, and obviously mm -hmm. it was not a, a good idea, but at that time it definitely felt like it relieved a little bit in some way, my inner turmoil that was going on at that time. So, yeah. Um, of course, next we uh, want to cover what are the signs, you know, that someone should be looking out for when it comes mm -hmm. to self-harm. Um, you know, I think that one can be a little difficult because sometimes, you know, teenagers, you know, as we can already imagine, are already irritable and withdrawn sometimes, you know, even the ones who aren't self-harming or... Um, you know, all of us deal with stresses in our lives. So, you know, just talking about what specific signs should we really be looking for? Right. Uh, you know, um, irritability is one of those things where it's hard to pinpoint, right? Because we're all irritable at one point or another. Um, right. And I think it's someone who you know, like, you know, um, you've noticed there's a change in their behavior. They're um, isolating themselves. 
um, you know, that you might see someone with fresh cuts, burns, scratches, or bruises on them. Um, you know, they having wearing long sleeves or long pants in hot weather, um, difficulties with interpersonal relationships, um, persistent questions about personal identity, um, some maybe behavioral and emotional instability, impulsiveness, like just, or maybe just feeling down and depressed um, and saying things that, you know, that can hint on the fact that they may feel helpless or hopeless. Um, so noticing these things can help, um, you know, whether or not they're engaging in self-harm, it's just important to check in on our right. peers who are struggling. Definitely. Yeah. I was about to say that too, you know, even if someone isn't self-harming, but mm -hmm. just the fact that maybe you're already like wondering, like, hmm, you know, something has changed, you know, we could even catch it before someone starts self-harming, you know, maybe they've already started to have those thoughts, but haven't fully gone through with them. So yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think it's different for everyone too. You know, some people might put on the brave face and, you know, don't want anyone to know at all, you know, and want to act, you know, smiley and laughy and happy you know in front of their family and maybe in front of their friends it's it's different you know yeah. so definitely i i agree i think the stigma creates the shame and embarrassment making it hard for people who self-harm to get help mm -hmm. um and so looking out for yourself and your and your friends and if you suspect um that someone in your life is self-harming um you know it's just it's really important that the importance of just checking in you know how are you doing and i'm sure we're going to get into that <laughs> yeah you actually just segued perfectly into it uh the next would be you know how do we go about having that conversation it can be so uncomfortable for many reasons and difficult one you know you could feel uncomfortable yourself as the person who's asking you know you could get nervous and anxious you also could have that fear of oh, what if they get upset with me? You know, what if I'm wrong and I, I offend them and then they don't want to talk to me at all? Or, you know, um, the fear of up, just simply upsetting them and triggering something. And, you know, the conversation can be difficult for a lot of reasons. So, yeah, what, what would be the best way to get into that? <clears throat> yes, I, I think so. Let's just start off with the checking in and ask how they're doing, acknowledging and understanding their pain. Um, I, I wouldn't fixate on the behavior itself. I would really open up that space for them to allow them to self to express their feelings and right. their pain and feeling that validation. Um, understanding, you know, also their intent, you know, is this is this an attempt? Is, is this something that may lead to um, them being at high risk? And are they feeling it now? And are, you know, do, should we seek urgent care, or seek professional help? Should we engage in crisis services at this moment if the, if the intent is really high? Um, but seek to understand the cause, then the behavior itself, like were they bullied? Are they undergoing a painful transition in their life? You know, what need, what is the need it serves? Um, is it to release negative emotion? And, and the support, the need, so the support to the need. So do they need compassion? Do they need to, like, if they really need to release this negative emotion, what can I do to help them navigate and sort of push through and maybe engage them in something else to release that negative emotion? Um, the more we get to understand the need, the better we're able to support that need. Um, so things you can say um, to people who are struggling, you know, I'm, I'm not leaving your side. We're in this together. Um, I can see that you're hurting and I'm here for you. And, and, and you know, the, the whole, I think this phrase has become so popular. It's okay not to be okay. You know, right. we all have our highs and lows. And, um, and, and honestly, and I, I love this. This is, it's not because, you know, engaging in self-harm does not mean that they're weak. It's because they've been so strong for too long, you know. Right. And, and it's okay if they don't want to talk. You know, we can just sit here together till the storm passes um, and just kind of truly I feel like the biggest thing is feeling connected and being checked in on and to feel that reassurance that they're going to be loved no matter what. Um, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I really like how you said that, that it's, it's not that they're weak. It's that they've been strong for so long because I think um, – from my experience and then also from, you know, just 
the general stigma is, you know, you're weak and, you know, a lot of other people deal with things that are way worse and, you know, or something like that, you know, and they're not doing that. So it's very true that, you know, it doesn't mean that you're weak. It means that you've been strong for so long. And sometimes, Mm -hmm. like you said, they don't want to talk. Sometimes that, you know, I feel in a bad mood even now and I'm just not in the mood to talk, but having someone sit there with me and say, all right, you don't want to talk. That's cool. Let's just sit here and watch this TV show together. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to talk about anything, but as long as you know that I'm, I'm here for you. And I think that everyone needs that, you know, everyone needs that emotional support, whether or not you're going to open up to me, I am here for you. And when you feel ready, or if you never feel ready, I hope you have someone else in your life that you can open up to. I agree a hundred percent. And, and it's, and it's just much more than a check-in. It's like this consistency of this continuing care for someone. Cause like you said, we all need that, you know, we all need each other for support. And, um, and I think it's just so important that we continue to care for one another as much as we would want someone to care for us too, in those moments we're struggling in. Yeah. And then I also, um, like that we need to first that you pointed out we first need to understand what is the self-harm providing them like what is it doing so then from there you can see what they need now in the terms of care i had right. never really thought about that before that for everyone because their reasoning is different right then their, then their care should also be different right absolutely um, yeah, and, and I've seen the different reasons and it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting to know what, what purpose it serves in their life. Um, you know, and it could be this just maladaptive coping skill that they're engaging in. Right. And so, and, and in treatment, what typically I would do is I would try to find something for them. If it's really that sensory thing that they're, um, that makes them feel that release, if it's truly sensory, I would say, let's get an ice cube and let's put it on, you know, where you would cut yourself just to feel that sensation to kind right. of replace that sensation with something that's less harmful. Um, and so we would find some grounding techniques that utilizes their senses and really continue to explore these, these triggers. Cause again, like self-harm cannot be solved overnight. Like they can't just bounce back the next day. Like, okay, I'm not self-harming anymore. It's right. hard it's really, really hard and it becomes really addicting. Um, yeah. So it's really important to find alternative ways to find that release that doesn't end up, you know, um, putting you at risk. Cause I, I also get nervous because sometimes one day you might cut too deep. Right. And so, you know, making sure that we engage other support systems who can continually monitor, check in, and engage in some sort of relational activity or engagement just so they know that they're not alone and things might get rough and tough and that we will replace these maladaptive coping skills with ones that are healthier to release some of that negative emotion or turmoil that they're experiencing. Right, right. Yeah, I like what you said about the ice cube. I remember um, for a while it was like the rubber band thing too. A lot Mm -hmm. of people would put that on their wrist and then – you know, just snap it whenever they felt a little impulse, you know, or were thinking about it. And it definitely helped them because it was a sensory thing, you know, sensory. And, yeah. Yeah. Which is really important. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, back in the day, they used to have this like no self harm contract, right. And that completely went out the window because it's like, I'm not going to can just sign a piece of paper. That's I'm not going to harm myself. Like and I that said, fixed it's, me, right? and that fix you or that solves the problem because I mean, if anything, let's engage in developing a safety plan to keep you safe and let's engage in ways we can list things that you can do to help relax, help you release some of this and, and find other support systems that truly that needs to connect and monitor and keep you safe. I feel like it takes much more planning than just this. I just signed a piece of right. paper and I promise my therapist, I'm not going to hurt myself. Like that, that doesn't do anything at all. And it doesn't reassure the therapist and it doesn't show no demonstration of how we can keep this individual safe. How can we include and incorporate like support systems that can continue to monitor and help this individual, you know, meet that need that they're seeking. Right. And so it's much more than that. And so, um, yeah, I've always, I've always, you know, when I started therapy, I've heard about the self harm, no self harm contract 
And it, and at that period, people were like, no, that, that doesn't really do anything. And what's the, what's the purpose because of liability makes no sense. Right. So I think it takes, it takes a, a, a support system to truly navigate and help someone recover and heal. It, it does. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen individually. It happens with a group of people who care and want to make sure that you are able uh, to get on the, on the road of self-healing and recovery and making sure that your needs are met, making sure that we're able to process the pain. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I remember signing one of those self-harm contracts when I first started therapy when I was 13. And I got sent to therapy because, you know, my primary care physician saw the the cuts and, you know, they told my parents, you know, the best thing to do would be to take her to therapy. And I remember when I signed the paper, I was like, you know, am I really, am I really sticky? It's just me grabbing a pen and putting a signature. But then they did, I remember the years following, we did develop the, the care plan and it was like step by step, like what can I do instead of this action? Who can I reach out to? And writing down the names of the people that you can reach out to so that you right. can remember these are the people that are there for me and that will be there for me no matter what. And I think also it's it doesn't happen overnight and then it feels so shameful when you slip up. You know, and then mm. and then shaming someone when they slip up isn't the right route to go either. You know, mm. it's let's talk about why this relapse happened and let's talk about how we can stop it from happening again. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's also when having this conversation, there's also some do's and don'ts, right? There's some things that you shouldn't um when having this conversation, maybe don't be dismissive or pass judgment, things like that. There's some very like um, things that you could just list. That's just number one, do not do that. Right. 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 Absolutely. We, so are we going to talk about the do's first or the don'ts or do you just, what would you like? What, to start uh, whichever one you feel you want to cover first. Um, you know, definitely, you know, let's do the do's. I, I like to start off with the with positive, the, the positive, the strength based ones. Um, we, we definitely want to validate people's feelings. Like that's like the number one thing, acknowledge that, you know, there is pain and it's important. People want to feel heard and understood. They don't want you to problem solve their issues. They want to feel heard and understood. They want to feel validated. Um, because it's, it's, it hurts and they haven't had a safe, a safe outlet to do so. So just providing them that space alone is it make wonders for them. Um, and for anyone really, not just for them. So validation is key. Um, and, and just acknowledging and just sitting in with them. You don't have to solve, you don't even have to talk to them, right? You, you can just, right. people just want just to feel that there's just support and, someone understands and recognizes that I'm in, I'm hurting and they're not pressuring me to change. They're not pressure. They're not shaming me. They're not dismissing my feelings. Right. They're acknowledging that space and they're holding that space for me. And a lot of times therapy does that. They hold that safe space for them. Yes. Um, and, and let's not pass judgment. Let's not, you know, um, sometimes again, we get fixated on the behavior and that became that be, you know, it's okay. So I'm cutting like, you know, but what's behind that? You know, let's get deeper. Let's connect on a deeper level. Um, and we can't just easily say to folks, all right, like, let's stop. You know, let's stop doing this. That's really bad for you. I mean, you, people, we all understand that, right? Sometimes right. you go to therapy, not because, like, you don't want your therapist to tell you what not to do. You've already heard it from all these people around you. Right. It's, it's much more than just saying, stop that, don't do that, it's going to hurt you. But really connecting, like, I hear that you're hurting. Tell me more about your day and your struggles. You know, um, yeah, that, I, I can only imagine what you're going through. I care about you. You know, I want to be able to walk this journey with you um, and make sure we get you the help and support that you need. So it's just opening up that dialogue, that open space. We don't have a, a formula. We don't have a script. It's right. just building that relationship and genuinely with a curious heart and with a compassionate heart, reaching out to them is, is more than enough, right? And just knowing that you're there. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very sensitive topic, you know, and there's a lot of shame and embarrassment. So I, again, I could only imagine what that's like for someone and how tough that conversation might be. But to the fact that you're acknowledging and you get it and you're there 
eases that eases that feeling of uncom you know uncomfort and allows them to be able to slowly open up to you. And the more validating you are, the more comfortable and safer they feel, and they end up telling you more again. And and then from there, you know, we can say, hey, it sounds like maybe seeing a therapist might be a great idea to get additional support. Um, and just just being, again, an outlet for them, a support system right. for them. Call me when you need me. I'm here. Um, let's talk about how tough things have been lately. You know, you've got to, you, you moved or parents have gone through a divorce, whatever it may be. Let's talk about it. Give them that space. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so comforting. Like I, I've never expected anyone to understand completely what I'm going through, but just to say, Hey, I don't know everything that you're going through. I've never been in your shoes, but I hear you and what you're feeling. It's completely okay. And mm -hmm. you know, when, it's it it's truly it seems like the smallest thing you know to just say oh yeah you know i, I get you like, you're validated you know and um but it's it's so huge for someone that's going through something that which could be a lot of things going through just a tough time and exactly yeah and then the don'ts of of um of approaching this conversation yeah i i mean again um don't be dismissive um you know, I think a lot of times it's really uncomfortable for us to like, what do I say? You know, I, if I talk about it, will they get even more depressed? You know, like, you know, will they think about self-harming again? Like, it's I think just, that's I definitely know, one of the fears. The, the fears that come with it. It's like a lot of times, you know, talking about depression or suicide or anything, it, it, it's scary. And I don't think people are, are, I know it's hard to say like they're equipped to talk about that. But honestly, it's just the simple fact of like, these are emotions. These are things that we, we, we all feel sometimes. And it's, I know it's uncomfortable for some because it might be this brand new conversation. We don't know what may lead, but the fact that you're allowing this conversation to come up um, and to just uh, say, Hey, you know, this is completely, it's common. Yeah. Tell me about your day. I've had a sucky day too, or I've had these feelings of feeling down and depressed, you know, um, but definitely like not being dismissive. Don't pass judgment. You know, let's not turn into a joke. Uh, let's not be insensitive because, yeah. again, this is such a sensitive topic. And, like, it's, it, it, you know, it's, like, not, not that you need to walk on eggshells or anything, but this is a serious conversation. Someone's mm -hmm. in pain. And let's be mindful of that space that they're allowing to even open up to you. And so it's just kind of, like, hearing them out and just simply saying, I hear you, you know? Yeah, most, most definitely. I, I agree. I think in my experience, uh, I was lucky to have the person raising me that understood and could be mindful and all that. But I definitely ran across other family members who were like, you know, uh, that's, you know, oh, back in my day, you know, I went through this, this and this, and you didn't see me doing that, you know, that's ridiculous. Why are you doing that? You know, and it was just very like, okay, you know, it made me feel like that's not a person I'm ever going to talk to again, you know, over anything mm -hmm. that is that sensitive. Right. Like suck it up. You know, I've got, I've, did, I've gone through that. I, you know, you know, like just, just again, everyone's different and everyone experiences things differently. We all have challenging situations and again, we're unique. And so we may emotionally react to things differently. Um, and like you said, you know, there might be some members who won't receive it well or won't give you that support that you're seeking. And if that's the case um, and you cannot identify a support system, I would say seek professional help because they will be there for you for sure. And there are text text hotlines and there's um, hotlines that you can call and there's I can give you a resources of therapists, private practice yes. or just community mental health willing to help. I mean, there's going to be help for you. And there is, I, you know, right. I'm definitely one of those. So yeah, it is possible to yeah. find that help. And now that you mentioned the resources, I realized I should have put this list a while ago in the beginning right now. Um, um, and I'll drop it at the end of the chat because I think uh, right now, if I get out, it will pause the video. But um, we do mm -hmm. have those uh, those listed, and then I can pin them on there. And then also, um, to bring that up, the resources, um, Connect OC, if you click on, um, for everyone watching, if you guys click on our uh, our profile, there is a highlight on the bottom. 
that with the little circle that also has crisis uh, phone numbers and resources that you know you can text, you can call. I think it's amazing that technology has brought us to this point where you can pick up the phone and someone can be at the other end to listen. And um, you know, I think sometimes we also really fear talking to people in our lives, whether it's friends or family or um, acquaintances, because it's like, ooh, I bring that up I, and I might have to see them tomorrow at school. And what if that's all they look at me as, right? That's, that's a fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And completely valid. And, and so, it, yeah. 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 And another question um, would be, let's say someone, whether it's a friend or a family member, and you see them have fresh self-harm, you know, cuts or burns or bruises, and it looks bad, like it looks like they might need medical attention, it looks like they might have gone a little too far. Um, at that point, would it be urgent to say, hey, I see this on you and I need, we need to talk about it now? Yeah, I would say, hey, I, I noticed that you have these cuts, you know, tell me more about what happened. And um, I mean, if they're also currently and actively cutting, because again, like if they cut too deep, it puts them at risk. Like, I care about you. I care about your safety. Let's go get this checked out. Because, you know, with open wounds, that can cause infection and other types of things, right? And so it's really important to say, I care about you. Let's get this treated. Let's get some right. help. It sounds like you're in pain right now. You know, and as you engage in that conversation, can I, can I take you? Can you come with me? Let's go together. Let's right. encourage them and not like, here, go, here's a therapist, call them. No, like, let's go together. It sounds like you need my support. Let's, let me take you. Let me drive you. Uh, let's get this checked out. Let's get your wound treated. And let's talk about next step together because I care about your safety and I want you to be okay. Um, and so just allowing that space again for them to talk and share about their pain, but also saying, let's also get this checked out. Let me like, just come with me. Let's go together. I'll be right. there with you. I'm not letting you go. I like not in an aggressive way. Like I'm not letting right. you go. Like I'm here for you. Um, right. I'm here for the journey, you know? And so I, I want to make sure that you get the help that you need. Right. Yeah. I think that's really important because I know that that could also immediately just scare someone, you know, it's never seen anything like that before. And just to approach that conversation, you don't want to take the bad route of, you know, Oh my God, you know, I can't believe you did that to yourself. Let's rush to the hospital right now. You know, you still need to definitely be asking, how are you? You know, how did this happen exactly? You know, what is it that led to this? For sure. Um, yeah, understanding their intent and understanding um, are, are they, how high is this intent? Like, you know, um, sometimes they, are they planning on cutting more? Are they planning on cutting deeper? Like, let's just understand. I mean, I know it's hard to explore that with the individual because, again, they're just, oh, my gosh, she saw my cut. It's fresh. Yeah. She probably thinks I don't, they're overwhelmed and they're afraid. And so it's like, I listen, you're hurting right now. Like, can I take care of you? Can, can you allow me to take care of you? Let's do this together. And I think that gives them a little ease, like, like no judgment. She actually cares and wants to help. Um, let, I'm going to have her be my support. Let, I'll go with you. Let's go get this treated. Um, right. and, and, and further assess because who knows what's behind all that. Yeah. And I think sometimes too, um, the fear. I remember being scared of sometimes saying how, um, certain things to my therapist or, you know, just like, I don't want to get sent to the hospital, right? You know, like, it was just that also that fear, which is valid, you know, it's scary to think about going somewhere that you've never been. And I've, I've been, you know, um, put in the hospital three times, you know, simply because my therapist was worried about me. And then there was also what one now that I'm an adult, I was worried about myself, you know, and I was like, I need to take this step in um, placing myself in a place where I will be safe for the next week, you know, until I can work through the issues that I have and the thoughts that I have right now. And I can go back and be able to be on my own in the outside world, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That can be a fear. And also with the conversation, I think it's also important to like pick an appropriate time and place to have the conversation. Um, maybe if you see the cuts and or you see you really want to bring up the conversation, maybe not to do it, maybe in the middle of a class if you're at school or maybe they want privacy. So you should think about that too. not bring it up in front of everyone at the dinner table right. or right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think being strategic about it, because again, if it's not wrong, if it's in the wrong type of timing and in the midst of a group of people, like, 
I highly doubt that individual is going to be wanting to share and open up about needing help. So finding the right time, finding the right moment. Um, hey, can I speak you for, can I speak with you for a sec? It's lunchtime or whatever. Do you have a minute to talk? Um, and just kind of pulling the side away from the crowd and just kind of having that one-on-one -on -one genuine conversation of like, I care. I've noticed this. What's going on? Talk to me. Right. Definitely. Yeah. And what would be the route that we take with someone that is just very set in not getting help? You know, just being really angry at the world, angry at everybody, you know, just very, I don't need anybody's help. I don't need your advice. You know, you don't know what I'm going through. So it's not, and this is how I interpret it. It's not that mm -hmm. they don't want the help. They're not ready yet. Okay. And I think they need this um, constant support. And some, because I think right now they're emotionally, you know, reacting, right? I'm just not in a place right now. I'm like really yeah. in my head about things. And I think they're just not ready. And the minute they start seeing you, how much you care and how much this is a safety concern or just the fact that you care and, I, and you recognize and acknowledge that something is going on, they're in pain, they're hurting. Um, I think they will slowly and surely say, you know, yeah, I think, I think I'm ready now. I think I'm ready to get help. Right. But not, you know, I, I would say not losing hope on that person. I think um, at that moment, that's how they're reacting. But the more we get to know them, the more we build that relationship, the more closeness and connection that we develop and understanding, the, you know, their, their pain, it will allow them to, to kind of, okay, I sought out support from my friend. And I'm beginning to feel better. And now we're talking about seeking professional help because this will truly like really help me heal. And I think they might begin to be open to the idea, right? I know we got to be careful with people's journey and their process and where they're at. You know, like as therapists, we need to meet our clients where they're at. We can't just assume they're ready. We need to kind of, again, explore, create that relationship and that safe space for them to talk about what has come so far of this um, what are their needs at this moment? What do they need from me at this moment? How can I help? And then eventually that conversation of seeking professional help may come up and they might be open to the idea. I wouldn't lose hope. I think that just the way we interpret that means they're not ready at this moment in time. But again, as a friend or a support, I will continue to monitor. I'll continue to check in on them. Right. And that's really important. Not giving up on them, not losing hope and not making them feel like, well, if you don't care, you know, or I'm interpreting it as you don't care about yourself, then I'm not going to care about you either, you know, and not reacting angrily towards them not being ready. It's a, it's a scary step to take, especially if they've been in that comfort zone so long, they've been that way for a while. And it's, it's scary to change. I think that's comes with life in general, no matter whether it's about self harm or about moving to a new place or making crazy life decisions it's it's scary to go through changes and I think there's also still a lot of stigma right with like um seeking therapy and seeking counseling and seeking a help it's 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 a uh, obviously we're here to break that stigma but it's still really alive and well sadly you know with a I lot am. of yeah you know mental health it the stigma behind it unfortunately still exists but I feel like I want to say we've made progress. I feel like oh, we're, we have a movement, you know, we are talking about mental health openly. We are acknowledging that, you know, we have these emotions and it's okay to have these emotions. Life is not perfect. We're going to have a wave of things. And just because you're seeing a therapist doesn't mean you have a problem. It just means I need to speak to someone with a, you know, a professional or a different perspective than mine. And, um, and just have that safe space for me to really talk out my issues, talk out my whatever it may be. And I think we all would benefit from that, not just a particular individual. We all would benefit yes. from having a conversation and talking about our struggles, our emotions, because we all have them and we're human. Most definitely. Yeah, I think uh, we definitely have made progress, uh, which I'm so glad for because, you know, we definitely want to move towards the place where more of us can have these conversations openly and not feel, you know, shame or guilt because like, like that phrase you said earlier, it's okay not to be okay. We don't have to be okay all the time. We don't have to be, you know, um, and no one else is okay either. You know, I, I guarantee you someone else is having a sucky day and sometimes saying like, man, that my day has been hard. It's like mine too. Like mine has been hard too. And 
let's talk about it and go get, you know, some ice cream together, or let's just sit here and talk it through. And it, it can really help knowing that a, everyone else is not doing as great as, you know, I make them out to be in my head. We're all human. Mm -hmm. And and I and I think the the issue is when we avoid, right? When we avoid feeling these uncomfortable feelings, when we are persistently suppressing them, it becomes hard to even endure them when they come up again. And this is why it's so important to talk about our feelings. It's because if we don't avoid them, we allow ourselves this freedom of of okay, we're gonna ride out that wave. It's gonna get tough, and then we're gonna come back down again, you know. And along that wave, we're gonna talk about it and not suppress it and not avoid it because that's when it becomes difficult to manage, right? And so acknowledging, like, I'm human. I'm gonna have my sucky days. I'm gonna feel bad and terrible some days, and I'm just gonna. I just need someone to talk to. I need a good whatever. I want to release it by just having boundaries, taking some time off from work, taking some time off for whatever it is, and just indulging in some wonderful self-care stuff that makes you feel good. Because we all need it, all of us. And I can't stress this enough. And so um, I, I even myself have to work on creating boundaries, making sure I get my self-care. Because I do have moments where I just like, oh my gosh, I'm drained. My body is letting me know that I'm not feeling okay because I need to step it down, like not, you know, like, let's right. just kind of create this boundary for myself and take it slow. Um, and once you engage in self care, not only are you nourishing your spirit and your mental health and your emotional health, even physically, um, because all these things connect, you then come back to work or come back to whatever it is refreshed, you know, we need that, you know, we're not robots, we will have exactly. we will crash sometimes, you know, exactly. So, I just want to normalize that because, you know, even therapists need therapists too. And so it, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that too is really important. Sometimes, you know, we look at our therapist and we're like, wow, you know, they're, they're so great. You know, they give us all this life advice and, you know, all this, but they need therapists too. You know, they have their days too. They're not okay every day. We're not okay every day. We don't have to be. Everyone is human and everyone is going through things that like you said when we are avoiding those conversations it just gets a lot worse and sometimes that can be how it starts and then it eventually leads to self-harm you've just bottled it up for so long and you just feel like you're about to burst and then eventually when you do you know it's not in a very good way mm -hmm. i completely agree with that and i'm happy that we're moving towards breaking that stigma of um, not being able to have those conversations. I even remember when I was younger, I was embarrassed to uh, bring up to my friends and it was kind of a secret, you know, like, where do I go at 3 p.m. on Wednesdays? Uh, I will never tell you, you know? And then a few years later, it was realizing, hey, my friends are having bad days too. And, you know, even telling them like, you know, you should ask your parents about going to therapy, you know? It's, it's normal, it doesn't mean anything's wrong with you. Let's exactly have someone else to talk to other than, me and our friends or your mom or your dad, you know, someone that really just holds that space for you and exactly. will always hold that space for you. Yeah. Super important. And I think um, when we talk about the resources as well that are available, we have those crisis hotlines, those text messaging. Um, and I think it's, it's also, um, it can be a little scary to navigate uh, how to reach those resources because a lot of the times we're thinking about paperwork and I've got to do this and that, you know, right? So it, it can actually end up being a pretty scary barrier to getting help is the conversations I have to have and the intakes and everything like that. I, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's always nerve wracking, you know, oh my gosh, I signed up for therapy and I got to do this intake and paperwork and yada, yada, yada. But let me tell you, you know, um, it's the anticipation that's scary, right? It's a stranger. How are they going to help me? And it's right. totally normal to have these thoughts, right? And I think what's important is give yourself that opportunity. Don't miss out on opportunities because the process might be like in the beginning might be too much paperwork. I mean, I work in DMH, so I, I totally get it. And I even tell my clients, bear with me here. <laughs> We're going to get through this first, you know, paperwork signatures and talking about confidentiality and all that good stuff that they need to know. And then, you know, we're not going to just take it fast. We're going to take it slow. Again, meeting you where you're at. Tell me about yourself. And you can right. share whatever you want to share. You don't have to get deep so quick. Again, when you're ready, you're ready. And so take it with your own pace. 
let your therapist know how you're feeling and how you want to take, um, how you want treatment to go, because it's about you, not about the therapist. And so it's important to give yourself that opportunity, that chance, feel empowered. And this is truly a service for you to really lead yourself in that road to recovery um, and healing and just finding yourself. And therapy can just be a place where you just find insights, you know, gaining a new perspective about life, right. about things, things about you that you want to continue nourishing, enhancing, because you have what it takes. Um, so I just, yeah, I mean, as you can see, I, I really love therapy. <laughs> yeah, you're passionate about um, it, which is great. I am. And I work with a lot of resistant clients who are like, I don't need this. And I get it. You might not need this. Um, give me a chance. Let's just see how far we can go. If it, it benefits hurt you. telling someone about your day. Right? Exactly. It won't hurt. And if it benefits you, great. If it doesn't, we can reevaluate where things are and, you know, discharge. But again, give yourself that opportunity. You never know how things will work out. Um, and again, you can always choose your therapist if you don't feel like you truly can connect. And it's you, again, just like doctors, you can change your provider. Yep. So don't lose hope. Um, there's plenty of opportunities out there and just a chance for you to like, just, you know, I think it's just wonderful. I think therapy is really a great way to just, um, spend time with yourself and be able to focus on you and be able to just, you know, it, it, I think, I don't know, I'm not being selfish, but I, I do like talking about my feelings. I do like talking about where I'm at in life. And, you know, I think it's wonder, it's a wonderful feeling to talk and have that safe space to do so freely with no one judging you. Yeah, definitely. We all deserve that. And it's not about being selfish. It's about, you know, I, I am the center of my universe, right? So I should be able to, so that I can be who I need to be for everyone else. First, I need to be who I need for myself, right? Exactly. We need to take care of ourselves before we could ever take care of anyone else in our life. Absolutely. Lives. Absolutely. Yes. You got to take care of yourself because how else are you going to take care of other people? How else are you going to support? You are, you need you time, you know, and we kind of neglect that sometimes because therapists, I don't know if there's a lot of therapists on it. We have this compassion fatigue. We give, we give, we give, we give. But what about ourselves? We're human too. We need to fill up our cup so we can fill other people's cup too. So I love that, what you said. Perfect. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And um, now I just want to uh, give some resources since I did not get the chance to pin them. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone just wants to write it down, if you guys, we can also find them, of course, on connect-oc.org. They're also listed there. But, you know, the crisis text line, it is text HOME to 741741. Easily to remember, 741741. Um, if you ever just, you know, you don't want to go through, I know it can be kind of awkward nowadays, talk on the phone. You know, you can text someone, hey, what's what's up? You know, what's uh, this is what I want to talk about right now. We also have the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 24-7, um, 800-273-8255. You know, it's there 24 seven, someone will answer the phone, you know, and that's really comforting to know as well. And um, yeah, I see that Blair put in connect. Uh, there it is dash OC dot org and for the crisis text line. Thank you for putting all that in. And if someone is in imminent danger, right, if you really think they are about to do something, don't take the chance of, oh, maybe they won't, you know, D don't try, you know, it's, it's just difficult, you know, be, say, okay, I hear you. I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to do this for your safety and call 911. You know, that is Absolutely. sometimes we do reach that point where we need to do that. And sadly, um, you know, it can be hard to do, you know, they could be right on the edge of doing something that could just take them away. And we need yes. to make sure. Yes, trust your gut. If you feel like something's off and something's wrong, do it because you're doing it out of love. You're doing it because you care for their safety. They'll understand. So right. if, if you feel like, I know my friend, something was really off. I saw these fresh cuts. I don't know if I can, if she can keep herself safe, do it. Because at the end of the day, you know, her, our life, you know, is at risk. And so I want to make sure that people do understand that sometimes these things are very, very serious and not, not that you need to investigate or assess if this is like, right. if it's going to end up, that's not your job. If you know something's off, trust your gut, call 911 or if they can go with you to the nearest hospital to get further right. assessed, take them. Yes, definitely. Yeah. That's really, really important to, um, to stress. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and sadly, we are at the 1150 mark and we have reached uh, the end of this wonderful conversation. I really found it uh, 
eye-opening even for myself and um, a lot of uh, great advice and stuff that you gave us today that uh, really I think I hope that everyone who watched enjoyed watching and really you can take something home from this today and um, you know go and do self-care today you know if you have that time remember to fill your cup too so that you can fill others cups you know it's it's so important to do it and to make time every week I know that we're always busy and we're always rushing and there's this definitely this you know just pressure of I gotta be doing something or you know I don't feel like I'm being fulfilled you know but no you know take take a nap go get your nails done yeah <laughs> you know, wake up, you know absolutely. listen to some music take a bath <laughs> every day all day every day right <laughs> yes Self-care is really important, not just once a week, but every day. Let's take advantage of the downtime that we have. And if you don't have downtime, make some, right? Make it's some. your life. You're in control. Take that 10, 10 to 15 minute break, an hour, whatever you may need, because it's important. Let's not neglect ourselves. Right. And we deserve it. Yeah. Deserve it, absolutely. Every single one of us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, of sadly, course. this is goodbye, but I'm sure we'll be seeing each other again. And, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, everyone that's watching, you know, stay in touch with Connect OC by, you know, giving us a follow, like, you know, we post about our events that are coming up um, on our Instagram all the time, stories and posts, you know, so just keep an eye out. We really appreciate everyone here. Love it. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a joy talking to you and seeing everyone on the comment section. It's yeah. Awesome. yeah. Yeah. We appreciate all your comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.